The second session was growth modulation for limbland discrepancy. And this session is very innovative session where he's going to speak about his new technique for use of growth modulation for the Perthes disease and some of the proximal femur uh, deformities. So welcome, uh, Professor Stevens. Once again, uh, our sincere thanks for accepting our invitation and sharing your views with uh, fellows and our pediatric orthopedic surgeons. This session is very important for us because most of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons are influenced by the work of Professor Benjamin Joseph, who popularized the virus mutation osteotomy for Perthes disease. And he was a very particular person, or he is a particular person, and he has given a very nice guideline when to do it, at what age is the ideal age for this uh, correction. And so we have a completely different approach to this problem. And this is a very good example of what I call it intellectual humility, that you always need to remain open to the different ideas and you should be acceptable and uh, really in a learning mindset to understand the new ideas. So with that short introduction, I invite Professor Peter Stevens to share his views on proximal femur deformity and persistence. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present once again to your colleagues. And I will preface my talk with this guest case that was recently shared via the internet. So this is not my case. This is a boy who's now just over 10, who's two years status post staged intertrochanteric osteotomy for containment for Perthes. And presently he has persistent hip adduction contractures, hip abductor weakness, and Trendelenburg gait with no improvement, plus pelvic obliquity. So the, the question posed to me with that picture was, uh, what is the role of guided growth? And I should rephrase that to say, what would the role have been? Guided growth in Perthes is anticipatory and preventative. Um, it's not a good salvage procedure. So here he was at age eight and a half with Perthes, and most of us would say um, containment is warranted. He's in the fragmentation stage and uh, showing subluxation with some acetabular dysplasia. So he had an osteotomy on the right side, and I believe three to four months later on the left side. And so despite proper indications, timing, technique, and good fixation, what went wrong? Well, um, I did osteotomies for 25 years, and I'll show you a worse experience than this. But in rethinking it, uh, we've always focused on containment of the femoral head, which is fragmenting. But remember that the head and neck share the same blood supply. So you have head and neck affected, that's two thirds of the proximal chondral epiphysis of the femur. And meanwhile, the greater trochanter has separate blood supply, is not intercapsular, and continues to grow uninhibited. So when you tilt the medial structures into varus to get containment, um, you may pay a price for doing so. And so in this case, the unintended consequences of ITO for containment which heretofore I had thought was, quote, definitive, include iatrogenic uh, weakening of the abductors and thus promoting acetabular dysplasia and not always containing the femoral head. So the only um, salvage for this case, I believe, would be staged valgus intertrochanteric osteotomies to regain abductor strength and very likely, at least on the right side, if not both sides, pelvic osteotomies. So this leads into the topic of guided growth of the proximal femur. And in general, I'll discuss applications and rationale for this, including timing and technique, and of course, case illustrations. We know that the counteropiphysis of the upper femur is a common structure as evidenced by O'Brien's line on the left and histologically on the right. This arrangement persists for several years, thus lending itself to medial or lateral tethering, just as we do in the distal femur or other long bones. The applications for guided growth of the proximal femur 
and I'll emphasize Perthes because of the controversial nature that was mentioned. <clears throat> coxa vera, be it congenital rickets or various dysplasias. Coxa valga, which is common in cerebral palsy, sometimes DDH, and hereditary multiple exostoses. My personal journey of pondering the mysteries of Perthes spans five decades. I suspect many or most of you will ponder it throughout your careers as well. And this is reflected in a uh, publication starting in 1980 in the inaugural. This has gone on to automatic uh, advance for some reason. I apologize, I may have to. Anyway, the most <clears throat> recent publication pending will relate to what I'm presenting in this talk. And that is guided growth of the greater trochanter with or without soft tissue release. This will be in the um, British Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics. So I'm gonna focus first on two surgical alternatives for Perthes. This is my own single surgeon experience. I apologize, it's advancing automatically. I'll keep going back. Um, for 25 years, I did the osteotomy shown on the left with greater trochanteric arrest. Unfortunately, the case was done before 2000, could not be recalled for the database and x-rays. But I switched 15 years ago to guided growth. So here's a draft of the article that will appear imminently in JPOB. And comparing methods of guided growth on the left, ITO on the right, the demographics were quite well matched. Again, being single surgeons, same philosophy. Um, so the age range was typically between five and 10 at the time of surgery. And uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, groups were quite well matched because I used the same surgeon using the same indications of whole head involvement, femoral head at risk, but switching away from osteotomy in favor of guided growth. The hearing classification, they were all B and most in Cs throughout uh, for the two groups. And again, the same time and indications. The classic theory of intervention is that there are serial infarcts in the femoral head. And by intervening during fragmentation, perhaps you can prevent collapse and extrusion. The ITO technique is fairly standardized as shown here with an arthrogram to assure containment, percutaneous longest tenotomy, varus osteotomy of whatever degree necessary for containment, blade plate or locking plate, and I always arrested the greater trochanter to try to prevent subsequent uh, overgrowth. And I typically use a single spike of cast if patients weren't trustworthy for one month or no cast if they were. Routine plate removal in my practice. This is a case somebody else had done an MRI before ascending him. You can see the ossified part of the trochanter is what would show on an X-ray and would be underestimated on an X-ray, whereas the true tip of the trochanter is higher than, than that. Nevertheless, he met my criteria for soft tissue release and uh, intertrochanteric osteotomy. So the negative center head to trochanteric distance begets weak abductors, which cause acetabular dysplasia persistent and progressive. This is ischemic, this is biomechanical. So I did the uh, arthrogram and um, with the Keith needle, here's the tip of the greater trochanter, again, not seen on plain films. Um, abduct 20 degrees or so, he had good coverage. And so I went ahead and did an osteotomy knowing that the trochanter was elevated and arresting this portion for a long range planning. And um, he's contained with a healed osteotomy. This is the trochanteric arrest here. Again, the tip of the trochanter is higher than you think. And one can't assume that an unhealthy femoral head and neck will reverse the varus that you introduced. So you are shortening the leg and decreasing abduction as well as elevating the trochanter, all of which may be problematic. Two years later, the hardware has been removed. He's still contained if you want to focus on the hip. However, he is already manifesting fatigue, trendelenburg gait, and discomfort at age 10 due to coxa brevis, weak abductors, acetabular dysplasia, and will undoubtedly need further surgery. This is the case that really changed my thinking. This is my own case. He, eight-year-old boy with uh, whole head femoral involvement, uh, fragmentation, subluxation, and at the time, as a strong believer in uh, 
ITO for containment. I proceeded to contain him. In this case, a 25 degree osteotomy. You can see a single spica because I didn't trust he and the family that much. Percutaneous tenotomy. And uh, that was the early post-operative finding. Two months later, out of the cast, he had this situation, which was far worse than when we started. And uh, I had hoped with physical therapy and time it might center, but here he is eight months post osteotomy with a serious problem, fixed pelvic obliquity, terrible gait, et cetera. And this was what was in my head uh, that I had done serious harm while intending to do good. So I tried to recoup with an open adductor tenotomy, including the gracilis, which is an important deforming force, and iliopsoas release in a petri cast for six weeks. And thankfully, he uh, regained concentric reduction, um, although male misformed femoral head and elevated trochanter. And over time, significant coxal magna, coxa brevis, limb length inequality. Here he is at age 10. This is uh, two years after his initial surgery at age 12 with persistent issues. And that's when I decided I could safely intervene and did a valgus osteotomy. Now the trochanter is where it belongs, abductors are restored and his gait was good and his limb lengths were pretty close. And we breathed a sigh of relief. However, between age eight on your left and age 16, he underwent numerous significant surgical interventions including time in casts, uh, physical therapy, et cetera. And so I salvaged this and, and told myself this is a good result, but I really knew that it's not. And that's when I decided I needed to do something differently in my own practice. So the sequelae of containment may be exacerbation of the limb length inequality, loss of abduction, elevation of the trochanter, abductor weakness and lurch, acetabular dysplasia and impingement, and um, thereby, it, showing that ITO may not be the definitive approach for Perthes, certainly not in every case. And so this is what I call surgeon's remorse. It made me think, well, I've been doing all these ITOs for 25 years and teaching these, and this was my mainstay for Perthes treatment. But um, what about cases like this that I had created? So this led me to think of a different approach, which is guided growth of the greater trochanter or tethering relying on the biomechanical benefits rather than focusing on containment at the outset. And the tethering may prevent the sequelae of ischemia, i.e. Uh, optimize abductor uh, lever arm and strength and mitigate against eventual acetabular dysplasia and impingement. And so the technique shown here in, in the comparative series, 82% uh, underwent this open adductor tenotomy, including longus, brevis, and gracilis and uh, the iliopsoas as well. And for those who say we, we shouldn't release the iliopsoas at the lesser trochanter, every time you do an ITO, you've effectively done that. So I'm not concerned about that. So this um, is done if standing abduction is less than 40 degrees, standing because it, it shows the effects of the gracilis. So here's the patient who, as you can see the tip of the trochanter marked there and uh, on, Abduction to 25 degrees, he's well contained, but you can see the tip of the trochanter further elevated. He had an open adductor release and iliopsoas, and then laterally through a small incision, the uh, plate is inserted over a uh, guide pin and transfixed with two screws. The length of the screws isn't critical, but of course in the greater trochanter, you don't want to go into the femoral neck or the blood supply, um, even though it's interrupted. Um, also the comment that you can't see that trochanter, well, the screw will hold fine in cartilage, it won't strip. And then um, because they've had an open adductor tenotomy, you can gain wide abduction, maintain it for one month in a uh, broomstick cast with a detachable bar so they can ride in a car, get through the door and so on. The parents can, I just use a single bar, I don't use the proximal bar anymore. Um, detachable bar so that they can, uh, get some hip movement under parental guidance, but they're not weight bearing for four weeks. Following cast removal, no bracing is, on, is uh, required. They can proceed to full weight bearing with physical therapy as needed to gain strength and resume sports and other activities as tolerated on their own schedule. 
And then an annual examination with an AP X-ray of the pelvis. If the plate, quote, migrates, end quote, you can remove or um, replace it or remove it, uh, depending on their age and your judgment, and then follow to maturity. Here's a case example of an eight-year-old <clears throat> who met all my criteria for osteotomy, but instead had the soft tissue release, lateral tethering, and eight-year follow-up. You can see the plate stayed in situ. The screws have spread widely. Uh, there's a slight reverse bend in the plate, and it's mitigated against significant acetabular dysplasia that he started out with. Importantly, he's maintained wide abduction and is active in sports. So no, the plate does not need to be removed in that situation. So regarding a small series of 40 guided growth versus 18 osteotomies, again, we couldn't retrieve two, uh, maybe two score of osteotomies done before 2000. Nevertheless, guided growth fared better in every category, Trendelenburg, Shenton's line, um, center head trochanteric distance and limb length compared to the osteotomy. The Stolberg classification also was better comparatively in the guided growth uh, group than in the ITL group. You know, they, they have Perthes and some will have poor Stolberg outcomes regardless of what you do, but if you do minor intervention and they tolerate it well, I think it's a better choice. So in conclusion, in the short term anyway, uh, ITO offers early containment. However, the unintended consequences may uh, be a drawback requiring more secondary surgical procedures and it may not be definitive as I was taught. In the long hand, longer term, the guided growth of the greater trochanter preserves the abductor length and strength, thereby and mitigates against limb length discrepancy because you're not cutting and tilting the femur into varus. In my hands, provided superior results with fewer secondary procedures and can be definitive. And summarized in this table, this is the same information, um, intertoke osteotomy versus guided growth. I should mention there's reduced risk and cost of the guided growth overall when you add it all up. So, and of course, the longer you follow up anything, the more issues you observe, especially in the ITO group. You would think that 48 years of experience in Perthes would confer wisdom, but I think humility is a more apt expression. And I look forward to you who are still practicing to come up with new ideas about prevention of Perthes, if not uh, mitigating the deformity through ever less invasive means. And moving from Perthes, this is Cox Avera in a five-year-old unclassified dysplasia. No other epiphyses involved, just hips. I think it's I think it's worse than a Myers dysplasia, and uh, acetabular dysplasia, Trendelenburg gait. The tip of his trochanter is up here. That's the uh, hemostat at the time of his arthrogram. And there's the tip of his trochanter, way higher than you would appreciate on plain films. And this is a simulated. Well, you know, what if we try to contain this rather large femoral head, like a Perthes? Well, that's going to put the trochanter above the acetabulum and caused incongruity and be a big problem. So of course, I chose not to do that. And you could argue a valgus osteotomy, but that has its own issues as well. So instead, I simply applied an eight plate on either side, no soft tissue release because he didn't have contractures. And so the tip of the trochanter is marked in red here, uh, left in place at age five. But then by tethering the lateral side, any potential growth of the femoral neck and head is unobstructed. And you can see at age 14, so this is nine years later, uh, the trochanters are at a, a, an improved height, not a normal height. The dysplasia persists, but hasn't progressed. And importantly, he's Trendelenburg negative, symptom-free and fully active with a minor outpatient procedure. This one I showed in part in our angular discussion, but this is a Cox Avera, which typically um, Schmidt metaphyseal dysplasia patients have this deformity. Ponsetti described a triangular defect in coxavera and congenital coxavera. I think if you consider the chondroepiphysis as one structure, this is the equivalent of a slipped chondroepiphysis or slipping chondroepiphysis as car cartooned here. This is her mother whom I treated in an earlier phase of my practice and with well-intended osteotomies, because of fixation issues in this condition and this size patient, I had to redo the um, 
her right side three times, unfortunately, and I think the left one twice. And uh, at age 16, this is her x-ray. She probably has had hips replaced by now. But despite my good intentions, um, osteotomies did not serve her well. So this is her daughter at 19 months, now walking with Trendelenburg gait and pain because of those stress fractures. And so at 19 months, I inserted plates in the greater trochanter region as well as around the knees. Over 12 months, when her legs were straight, I removed the um, pangenu plates, but left the others in situ. Here she is at age three, asymptomatic, legs remaining straight. See her once a year. Here she is at age seven. Now those plates have gradually migrated, i.e. the trochanter has grown past. At that time, I chose to remove both plates because uh, they were bothering the IT band. I think uh, what I should have done is just move them up and resecure them. But nevertheless, that didn't happen. At age eight, <clears throat> you can see that her genu valgum, which evolved, has corrected. Here she is next to her four-year-old sister when she's eight years old. Your sister is passing her up. Here she is at 13. So again, her trochanters aren't at optimal height, but she never had an osteotomy. She has no significant dysplasia and no symptoms. And so, um, yes, it would have been nice to have replaced those eight plates and have the trochanters lower, but it may be a moot point. Coxa valga is common in cerebral palsy. This particular patient has very long, slender femoral necks and a colleague treated him with osteotomies, which are well done, serve the purpose, et cetera. But look at the bending moment on those proximal femora, which is worrisome and the prominence of the hardware. So this is a, a major recovery for a slender child with CP. And yes, it works, but there may be a missed opportunity for a simpler solution, which of course is why I'm showing it. Perhaps this would have served him just as well without um, recovery issues. Regarding the technique of um, medial guided growth of the proximal femur, an arthrogram is helpful. So you can advance the guide pin just short of the articular cartilage. You wanna get through two threads past the physis if you can. And the screw selection size is four or five at the smallest or six, five or seven, three in larger kids. And early on, I tried to go as toward the periphery as much as possible, thinking it would correct faster. But I think it's a better idea to go, some people would go in the center or at the junction between the middle third and the, um, and the medial third. And nevertheless, you wanna confirm on the arthrogram that you're not penetrating the joint. You can always put dye in the screw and make sure it doesn't leak into the joint and back it out a little if you have to. But uh, this is a very simple technique for uh, achieving this goal. The post-operative management is unrestricted activities. This is a simple outpatient procedure. Um, I'd follow up uh, every twice a year with this AP x-ray, the pelvis. I rotate the hips inward 15 degrees so you can see what the next shaft angle is doing and then reposition or remove the screws as needed. So it's a you know 10 minute procedure to exchange the screw and put it at a better angle if you're losing your grip. This patient had had a prior intertrochanteric osteotomy that grew into valgus, hence the tethering rather than another intertrochanteric osteotomy. So this patient has a chromosome deletion with autism, poor comprehension, poor bone stock. Uh, with Cox of Alga and uh, he's nonverbal, but decreasing ability to walk basically. On the AIR view, you can see that the neck shaft angle is true valgus. On an AP view angle, you may confuse antiversion with valgus, but this is confirmatory for valgus. He also had genu valgum and plano valgus feet. So here's a boy with osteopenia, cognitive impairment, and to subject him to bilateral proximal femoral osteotomies, bilateral distal femoral or tibial osteotomies and foot osteotomies was um, unappealing to me. So I, did what I would term as another version of single event multi-level surgery, placing as an outpatient, placing two screws, approximately eight plates here. He corrected over the next 18 months or so and arthroresis for the feet. So this is about an hour long outpatient procedure for him with no cast, no delay in the limited ambulation he could do. His walking abilities improved, he seemed comfortable and the acetabular dysplasia that he was developing has improved 
to a degree that uh, he won't need osteotomies at age 20. This is a patient of mine who had a closed reduction for right DDH. I don't have her pre-op x-ray here. She spent um, <clears throat> six weeks in her spica cast, six weeks in a broomstick cast, which was my routine for DDH, and three months in abduction splint, mainly at nighttime. But at 20 months, things weren't going that well. Clinically, the hip was stable, and O'Brien's line looks good, so there's no growth arrest. Um, but obviously, this is not a, a good situation. Because she was doing well clinically, and with a normal exam, I said, well, we'll wait a little bit longer and see, and it did not improve with time. So at age two and a half, I said, well, I you know, can't keep doing that. This is the AIR view, simulating whether you believe in pelvic osteotomy femur or both simulating that an osteotomy would serve her well and because of the anniversary was significant I elected to do the femoral osteotomy in a two and a half year old and hold up hold off on the pelvis so here's her osteotomy and Shenton's lines restored and uh, I was happy with that this is the initial healing and the plate was subsequently removed however once again the iatrogen nature of the things we do creeps in because her osteotomy, in fact, was not definitive because it produced, while solving the one problem of correcting aniversion, produced iatrogenic deformity, including femoral overgrowth of two centimeters, coxa valga, and because of this, long leg dysplasia. And so um, the plate was removed, of course. You can see the pelvic tilt. And on this, I caution you against making these measurements with a pelvic tilt for the same reason that spine surgeons don't measure scoliosis unless the pelvis is level. So on the same day, with the two centimeter lift, with the pelvis level, the acetabular dysplasia doesn't look quite as significant, um, and the CE angle was better. And I reasoned that the real issues here were her coxa valga and the, the overgrowth of her leg. And of course, a shoe lift won't help that. So um, by the way, this phenomenon, which is reminiscent of Cosins and cubitus varus and other conditions was described by Harold Frost as regional acceleratory growth phenomenon. It can happen after a fracture, infection, surgery, or injury to a long bone, and is fairly nonspecific. In her case, it caused significant problems. I tethered her distal femur to equalize her leg lengths and then remove those plates that took, um, this, is, this should be six plus eight, it took about a little over a year to correct that. Keeping an eye on this, but the coxa valga persisted on the AIR view here and is present on both sides. And as we know, oftentimes if there's dislocation of one hip, there's dysplasia or suspicious findings in the opposite hip. And indeed, she had coxa valga on both sides. So with an arthrogram, I placed these screws at age seven. And eventually she underwent a Pemberton on the uh, left side. You can see the screw here, the screw had been removed and was not replaced because I didn't feel it would be necessary. And that's a recent picture. So she will be observed for dysplasia on this side, limb lengths, et cetera, but uh, we've saved her a couple of intertrochanteric osteotomies. I'm sorry, this is the most recent, 11 plus eight years old. These screws <coughs> can optionally be removed, but are basically not causing any harm. This side looks pretty reasonable for uh, um, approaching maturity. So in summary, Guided growth of the proximal femur with respect to Perthes and Coxa vera preserves the abductor's abductor strength and mitigates against dysplasia. And for any of these, has a low complication rate. It's easy to revise and uh, is a suitable alternative in my practice to ITO, which I heretofore was a strong champion of. And, you know, I was among the skeptics in the early 90s, uh, proud of my posterior meter release and surgical treatment of club feet. And to my surprise, the Penn City technique over, it took a decade, but worldwide it replaced the standard treatment of club feet at that time. So I surmised that maybe there's potential that ITO will also decrease in popularity in favor of selective guided growth because it's a lot easier to do, less expensive, safer, and you can still salvage guided growth with an osteotomy, whereas with an osteotomy, um, you, can, you, you can't use guided growth to salvage an osteotomy. Once you commit to this path, it's going to be further osteotomies as needed. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you, Professor Stevens, for beautiful explanation about this. Uh, I'm sure that the audience will have a lot of questions. Uh, but before that, I would like to ask a very simple question that uh, in Parthis, the first aim of uh, surgery or doing anything is to put a uh, avascular femoral head into the acetabulum. And that we do it by virus derotation osteotomy. So basically, the aim is to bring the avascular area into the acetabulum under the cover of acetabulum. Now, what you suggested is when we carry out a trochanteric epiphysiodesis by a eight plate, the trochanter growth will be stopped. But will it have any effect on the containment part? Yes, you showed us that you give a plaster for one month. But is it sufficient because we need a, a long-term containment, one month containment in a plaster is not adequate. So what do you think about that? Yeah, well, the short answer is I think containment has been a mantra and it's been perhaps overrated to the exclusion of every other feature, including range of motion and abductor strength. And so, you know, many of the patients with Perthes Yes, they have ischemia of the femoral head. That's the focus of our attention on plane radiographs. But we're forgetting that regardless of whether you contain with an osteotomy or try or anything you do, that if you leave the abductors weak or you make them weaker, you'll get acetabular dysplasia that, that you won't be well contained either. So I think it's hard for surgeons to be patient and for parents to await the subtleties of guided growth. On the other hand, if you can do a simple procedure that and with the soft tissue release begins wide abduction, wider than any osteotomy, you're not subtracting abduction of 20, 25 degrees in, for the sake of containment, that the range of motion and the strong abductors provide for gradual containment in many cases um, <clears throat> that will take a lot longer. But the time is not so important. You know, the, when I've done the, I, I did before retiring, you know, 50 guided growths and none of them had, they weren't all contained, but none of them have the sequelae that would require the intervention of osteotomies, FAI, PAOs, and so on. It's just a much simpler, subtle approach. And, um, but it requires patience and understanding and explanation to the parents and not focusing on the fragmenting femoral head which will still fragment and may lose containment, like the guest case I showed in the beginning, like my own case, that if you have a case or two or more of that, it gives you pause to say, well, maybe containment is not the only, it's not certainly not the only critical feature. Okay. And, and you know, the one, month, the one yeah. month in the cast is to keep the adductors from getting um, contracted. It's, it's, it's make me feel better that they're going to maintain the abduction I've, provided, which they have, and uh, has nothing to do with ischemia, because no, ischemia won't change in a month. But strong abductors will hold sway and, and help gradually um, provide containment by normal activities. Yeah, then uh, there was another question, the technical question by Dr. Jitendra Jain. Um, the question is, uh, when trochanter is not fully ossified, in that case, how do you decide where to put the proximal screw or how to label the plate? So I, um, <clears throat> I, I put a, a needle or a hemostat at the tip of the trochanter under fluoroscopy. And, and then it's easy. You can either put in that epiphyseal screw first and then put in the plate. And mind you, when you're putting the plate in the proximal femur, both screws are aiming caught at proximally to parallel that physis. Or you can put a Keith needle in and put the, the plate over it. But the, the, the trochanter does not need to be ossified. And by the way, I, I question the mantra that I have quoted and taught that the greater trochanter stops growing at age eight. Um, Edgren and others proposed that in the 60s. But I think that's, that's uh, empirical and not true. And also in children with Perthes, most of them have a delay in bone age of about 18 months. So you know, you, you're bumping that toward 10. I don't think I would do a trochanteric tethering over the age of 10 um, for Perthes. I wouldn't rule it out, but um, the main benefits are between five and 10. 
The other comment I didn't expand on here is I've had patients who presented, who developed perthes at age four, and I, I told the parents, well, they're going to do well, you know, without surgery. And then 10 years later, they come back and they have a tall stroke and in coxa brevis. And throughout, they were active playing sports, no pain. But the insidious deformity of coxa brevis evolved. So I have a low threshold to, in a five-year-old, even without a contracture, to put an eight plate on the greater trochanter to prevent the 10 year sequelae that I saw in my own practice. It, not all four-year-olds do well. They may not have pain and limping, but that doesn't mean they're gonna do well by the teenage years. Okay, uh, in the case of virus deterioration osteotomy, we uh, take a lot of factors into consideration whether to operate or not. The first is the age of the child. The second is the stage of the disease. Uh, the third is the range of motion at the hip joint. The fourth is whether the extrusion is present or not. Now, do you take all these criteria into decision making or like uh, you carry out this procedure irrespective of these factors? When I was doing osteotomies, I did, but then I had my disappointments that made me question the, um, well, for example, in any series, the patients who do best are in the kind of the early stage of fragmentation and the ones who do worst, you say, I wish I'd done it six months sooner. So there's that nebulous gray zone, but the, the beauty of guided growth is you don't need to pay attention to any of that, except um, when they're standing, if you do supine abduction of the legs, you'll get one measurement. If you do it standing, it'll be more revealing because the gracilis is in play, just like the Phelps test in cerebral palsy. And so the gracilis is a, is a big player in perthes and a percutaneous adductor tenotomy begets nothing. Now, I used to do a perc tenotomy, ITO 20, 20 degrees on average and a trochanteric arrest. And, and I wrote an article in the middle of that third slide that, that promoted that, but uh, that was oversimplifying things. And so um, I, you know, I became disillusioned with my own osteotomies. I think one should be critical of their own practice and the dogma that we learned and teach. And if you get a bad result in your own practice, you can say, okay, I followed all those criteria like I did in the case I showed you and I got a, a terrible result. How do I explain that? And so maybe, maybe I need to rethink the whole thing and change my approach. I had no regrets like that with guided growth of the trochanter with soft tissue release. Oh, so back to the gracilis, you need to do an open lengthening, longus brevis and gracilis, and you can get very wide abduction. And I think that, I don't know if that changes the vascularity of the femoral head, but it certainly changes the range of motion, which is good for the cartilage, which can't hurt. And they don't get contracted again. Uh, then there is another question that in a small subset of patient, uh, there is a hinge abduction. So what do you do for such cases? Uh, the very same treatment. I, I would do the soft tissue, extensive release in four weeks in a Petri cast. And I would reason that um, maybe they won't be contained down the road, but if they can get that much abduction, it's gonna help round out the femoral head without um, direct intervention. And if not, I have skilled arthroscopy uh, colleagues who could go in and, and address FAI, remove a bump and so on. And the other, the other comment is that, you know, hopefully not many, but some of these patients eventually have a hip replacement. And I think it's a much cleaner field if you've just had a trochanteric plate than if you've done an osteotomy with hardware and so on, or two osteotomies. Okay, then uh, there is another question by Dr. Pratip Tati Rambabu. Which part of the trochanter eight plate is put in the middle? So that was about like the, how do you label the uh, plate at, at like, how do you decide? I think already you have described that, but would you like to elaborate more on that? Well, yeah, the center hole of the plate is at the level of the apophysis of, of the physis. And so whatever sticks up above that, and, and you know, there are different height plates and certain companies make wider plates if you want to span a wider version. I will say that even in this series, I reason, well, after my adolescence, the trochanteric plate doesn't help anymore. And if it's if it has loosened or is bothersome, I'll just take it out. And then 
a couple of those, the trochanter grew, one of them grew enough that I had to do a trochanteric transfer. So I decided, well, if they're, you know, 12 or older, fine. But if they're up to 12 or thereabouts, I would just move the plate upward and say, let's get another two, three years out of this if we can. It's a lot easier than a troch transfer. Uh, then there is uh, Dr. Raghavendra Tripathi wants to ask question. Please unmute yourself and ask question. Pardon me? No, Dr. Raghavendra, please uh, yeah. unmute yourself and ask yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. This opportunity to ask the question. Yeah, please. Uh, hello. Uh, can you listen to me, sir? Hello. Yes, yes. Is that uh, uh, as you have described this growth, uh, but the thing is that if the child already has, and when you apply these plates uh, for the for the growth modulation, time being uh, till this uh, EP five CO disease shows its effect and its uh, magical uh, actions uh, for this these uncontained hip. Uh, what uh, what precautions uh, you advise to the patients uh, uh, for these uncontained hips? Well, I I would I haven't had that experience, but if I did, I, I'd probably give it a year with the with the tethered trochanter, and uh, just thinking there may be some delayed benefit from the strong abductors and so on. But you haven't burned bridges that uh, that patient could have either bump removal or valgus osteotomy uh, down the road. You know, you, you, can, you can salvage with other procedures as needed. Um, I, I just haven't run into that situation. I, I'm, not, I'm not unconcerned about containment. I just think it's been emphasized to the exclusion of the long range follow up and the other issues that osteotomy can produce. Okay, and then the another question is about at the earliest age you can carry out this procedure and the latest age where you have carried out this procedure. Well, so, you know, metaphyseal dysplasia is I, I, the one girl I showed, I did it at 19 months. And the oldest, if it's a syndromic patient, <clears throat> then the rules of growth and maturity are unknown and you know I wouldn't rule out during adolescence. I mean I wouldn't do a 14 year old, but I'd do a definitely 18 months to 10 years old in general, not not for Perthes. For Perthes it would be between typically five and 10 chronologic age. Um, but possibly a little more. And um, the so the upper age is unknown. I, I don't know how long, you know, it's a common counter epiphysis for probably the first eight years of life, but maybe longer when you do a surgical dislocation of the hip and, and reflect the abductors, you can still see the trochanteric, the common physis that's posterolateral lateral and doesn't show in x-rays. So it may persist longer than the textbooks say. And I, you know, in, in Perthes, I'm not expecting, I worried when I first did it, which was 2005, what if it causes coxa valga and and uncovering, and it does not. I just don't think there's enough growth potential in the femoral neck and head to, to produce that deformity. Uh, then there is another question, like at what age do you consider to remove plate, the trochanter plate? Um, I only remove it if it's symptomatic or it's lost its purchase. You know, if it's bothering the IT band, it's, it's funny because in that location, you'd think they'd all be bothered, but they're not, you know, initially. But down the road, I showed one where they loosened up in that metaphyseal displays just so I took them out. I kind of wish I'd moved them up, but that was a learning process. Um, but then there are others who were, you know, uh, late teens who still had plates there and have zero symptoms. There's no need to remove it. Uh, then there is another question from Dr. Jitendra Jain. Uh, where do you do the psoas kinotomy. Uh, do you do at the lesser trochanter or you do yes. it like what we do it in cerebral palsy over the bream, which is a aponeurotic lengthening? I do it at the insertion. And I can tell you uh, honestly that these kids can climb stairs and play sports and have no ill effects. And I reason that every time you do a, um, 
intertrochanteric osteotomy at the level of the trochanter, you have released the iliopsoas at its insertion. So I, you know, I, I don't uh, discriminate. I take them all off the trochanter. Okay, because there is a, a big controversy in cerebral palsy, whether uh, should we go for the tenotomy at the lesser trochanter or should we go at the uh, brief? That's a controversy in cerebral palsy population. Yeah, I don't know if that controversy is still happening in the U.S., but I, I never bought into that uh, extra incision preferential treatment for the same reason that um, the kids with cerebral palsy who need that release are probably not going to be testing the iliopsoas the same way. But then again, those who are at Perthes and other things can play every sport you can think of. So I think we've overemphasized that um, without proof that it's necessary to go to the brim. Uh, then there is another question that, do you believe in known weight bearing because uh, the trochanter epiphysiolysis is going to take some time and the avascular femoral head is soft. So if we continue weight bearing, then there are chances that it may uh, get collapsed. So do you keep the child known weight bearing uh, for a few months after this procedure? No, not at all. In fact, Part of the problem in Perthes is the muscle imbalance, um, overwhelming adductors and weak abductors. So by lengthening the adductors, you're achieving some degree of muscle balance and way better motion. And I think that offsets the risk of weight bearing. Uh, by the time they're actually, so they're in a month, month in this abductor cast, and it's probably another couple months before they can want to run and play sports with or without therapy. So you've got a, a three month window, but during that time, you got much better abduction of the hips. You've addressed the muscle imbalance, and who knows if it changes any of the vasculature going on? I have no idea. But I don't restrict weight bearing. Dr. Schoenaker presented and wrote up a series of 220 um, Perthes patients treated without osteotomy, who had percutaneous adductor tenotomy and uh, petri cast for I believe three months, and then abduction bracing for two years, sort of a Ponsetti equivalent. Who knows what the compliance was, but I, but he wasn't doing trochanteric tethering until <clears throat> we got together and discussed it. I've never used abduction bracing, um, and have not regretted it. Okay. Uh, then there is another uh, question from Dr. Jitendra Jain, a very important question. In cerebral palsy, we have seen that even after varus osteotomy, again there is a rebound of the vulgus. So when you carry out a transfusion screw. Uh, for the bulgus deformity of the cerebral palsy, how do you follow up the child? Uh, do you keep the screw till the child is mature or you remove when uh, the certain neck shaft angle is achieved? Um, I leave the screw in there. But, you know, the upper femur doesn't grow as fast as the lower femur, for example. So I would leave it in there preferentially. And I, I've never had one that went into varus that overcorrected. So I just leave the screw there. In fact, so earlier in my practice, in a girl with DDH unilateral, I did three intertrochanteric osteotomies. The first one was for um, <clears throat> antiversion, and the next two were for valgus and overgrowth before I realized, well, that's you're chasing your tail. So I've had occasion to do a, a varus osteotomy when needed and put a screw there to prevent <laughs> recurrence, but that's, that's a rare case. That's an adolescent case. Um, but there's no harm in leaving the screw there. And, and unless you have obvious overcorrection, you take it out. Okay. Uh, then there is another question that uh, when there is a valgus in the cerebral palsy child, uh, when you put a screw, do you carry out a soft tissue release in the form of adductor release and the psoas release? Well, I would, except, you know, in this country, there's a lot of use of Botox and Baclofen and non-surgical treatment, which which I was a little skeptical of in the beginning, but you know, I would defer to the um, pediatrician and neurologist in terms of if, if they want to continue that management um, and there's not an obvious contracture, then I wouldn't. But if there's a significant contracture in extension, then, um, then I'd have a low threat. The tenotomy is a simple thing to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I request uh, Professor Hitesh uh, Shah, who is with us, and he has probably the largest experience of managing the Perthes cases in India. 
So Hitesh, uh, what are your questions and what are your concern about this procedure? Thank you, sir, for the good presentation. Uh, I, I know that the 15 years back in the United States, the trochanteric epiphysiodesis was a big concern. Except Dr. Alvin Kropfer, nobody was believing about the trochanteric epiphysiodesis. And it, mm -hmm. was a, it was a big issue. Even the, they were not considering trochanteric epiphysiodesis with the intertrochanteric osteotomy. The, my question is there for you. What would be the, in your experience, what is the frequency of overcorrection where there is a tip of the trochanter will go 10% more than the center of the femoral head? So overcorrection of tro trochanteric tethering? Yeah. Uh, I not observed that. If anything, it's been under correction because like I say, instead of moving it up, I removed it. And so, but I haven't seen overcorrection. Um, if I had overcorrection, then I guess I'd take the plate out and put a medial screw in there. <laughs> you know, treat it, treat it non-osteotomy uh, non, uh, if possible. Because honestly, we, and we have studied our 100 case with trochanter epiphysiodesis with uh, skeletal maturity. We do see 10 percentage of the overcorrection despite of the varus osteotomy. So that would be a cause for concern. And then we were selective for the trochanteric epiphysiodesis because of the 10 person cases, because coxa valga will increase the forces across the hip and that can lead to the degenerative. That was the cause of concern. Second question, what would you do the case, which is very borderline, like uh, nine and a half or 9.75, would you do the same? Yes. And, and, and I, I do a skeletal age on all my patients and they're a lot of times the nine and a half year old has eight year old bone maturity, but okay. I do it because the alternative is an osteotomy. And so I tell the parents, I don't mm -hmm. know if this will be enough correction, but it's, but it's worth a try. And so I'm, I err on the optimistic side there. So okay. I would do it. Because it was very popularized by the, one of the article from Jim Gage say that trochanteric epiphysiodesis would be, useless after the seven years, which we also challenged the 15 years back. But th then it was very, very popular in United States that trochanteric epiphysiodesis may not work after the seven. <laughs> yeah, I, when I was a chief resident under Sherman Coleman, I reviewed his trochanteric epiphysiodesis and uh, the results were disappointing and, and I didn't want to embarrass myself and him. So I said, Maybe we can compare it to transfer. So I morphed that into that Cox of Brevis paper that was published in JPO number one. Um, diplomatically, that was the right thing to do. But I disagree with Dr. Gage that, you know, seven is an upper age limit. The other thing is the trochanter is, you know, it's been said, well, the apophyseal, the, the physeal growth stops by age eight and the rest is apophyseal. Well, yeah. it's there already. It's just ossifying. And because it's there, that's where the abductors attach and that's where they have weakness. And out of respect for that, even especially in Perthes, I don't want to make, I don't want to foreshorten the abductors even more. Okay. And the third one, one of the technical question, uh, would you consider as Stuhlberg one and two is only good outcome? Because in your presentation, 79 versus 43 percentage for only considering Stuhlberg four and five. So would I consider one and two years a good outcome? Yes, only one and two, not about four and five. Yes, three, four, and five should be together, and one and two would be together. Yeah, I, I like any series, especially single surgeon. You, you want to get as many patients as you can, mindful that the shorter the follow up, the less conclusive you can be. And I had longer follow ups on the osteotomies, but as I said, prior to 2000, we couldn't get their x rays and data to okay. compare. But I know from treating all those patients, and switching, I stopped doing osteotomies in 2005 with no regrets. So the longer follow-ups, my partners are seeing them and I'm not aware of any issues that were created by guided growth that you know required surgical management. So to get it published, uh, to get a reasonable size series, um, you have to be a, a bit lax on your follow-up criteria. Obviously they should all be followed to maturity, but that's, Somebody else has to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
the uh, one more another technical question uh, the despite of the fact it was a good result in your series why the growth modulation couldn't correct the 30% of cases the sentence line is broken and 20% of cases return back positive right so i uh, those those results are the ones that time will tell whether they um, remain asymptomatic and avoid surgery or not. And I think we'll know by late adolescence whether they have FAI or Tendelumber gait or subluxation that's, that's persisting. Um, they, you know, it, it's, it's a weak point in the paper, I acknowledge, but it's no weaker than the osteotomy papers I wrote, which have similar issues. Okay. Yeah. Now I have a question for you. Yeah. If your grandson was seven years old yeah. and had fragmentation and head at risk, yeah. what's your preferred treatment? Yeah, uh, one of the important points, we, I, I don't consider the stage of fragmentations. Second, I don't consider head at risk. I, what the both cases, what you have shown that we do very early surgery in stage of AVN. We do not wait till stage of fragmentation. So as soon as the diagnosis, I will perform the containment surgery with trochanteric epithelioidosis. So I, I yeah. get hesitation <laughs> very early. And in fact, we have shown that the natural history paper and the, the bypass paper, one third of the all the trochanteric osteotomy with uh, trochanteric epithelioidosis with containment, they bypass the stage of fragmentation. So then and they do very well. Almost they will end up in stage Schulberg one or two, and sparicity deviation score is less than five or ten. Good. Okay. Then there is another question, a surgical uh, technique related question. Uh, in cerebral palsy, we have both valgus and increased femoral antiversa. So, in that case, where do you put the screw? For valgus and what? And the antiversa. So it's a, a well, three-dimensional so deformity. Yeah, if, if the interversion is 20 degrees excessive, you'll likely need a rotational osteotomy. However, um, let's say it's a cerebral palsy child who has both. I would consider, and if they're big enough, a mid-shaft osteotomy with a, a small intermedullary rod through tiny incision, no quads elevation, no risk of loss of fixation in the upper femur, et cetera, and the screw. So you can do two procedures simultaneously to correct each deformity. But I can't tell you that the, the proximal screw will change rotation. So, you know, if the rotation is significant clinically, then uh, it requires either a proximal osteotomy, if that's what you're wed to, or mid shaft, which is my preference for rotational deformities. Now we are working on the means of change, as many are changing rotation without osteotomy. So there's the potential for a rotational guided growth of the distal femur combined with valgus guided growth. So there's no osteotomy, but that remains to be uh, further developed. I think osteotomies are a relic from the last century. And whenever we can prevent them by simpler means, we should. And osteotomies are not definitive. In fact, philosophically, I've told the residents nothing humans do is definitive, whether it's spinal fusion, total hip, ACL repair, none of it's definitive. So let's, let's not use that as the rationale for doing what we've always done and we're taught to do if there's a better way to do it. Yeah, thank you. Like we had a great discussion on this uh, topic and I'm sure that uh, we will uh, go on getting more and more questions in which I will share you with uh, you by email. Uh, before we end the session, we would like to see your case where you have done the correction uh, of the distal radius with uh, growth, uh, guided growth. So, right. yeah. So yeah. This Please. is uh, my, my colleague who, he's, he's an oncology surgeon, a pediatric oncology, and we all know that hereditary multiple exostosis is not on oncologic. However, they present with bumps, <laughs> so they get sent to those guys. I did a lot of HME surgery for various things before he joined my practice. So this is his case, and uh, he did an acute ulnar lengthening as shown in the middle. 
with an intercalary graft and supplemented that with um, tethering the radial styloid as shown here. That's, and those are not cannulated screws, which is fine because you needed small hardware, so it wouldn't be prominent and they're easy to reach anyway. And uh, the short screw maintained its purchase. I'm not sure the time frame between those two pictures, but you can see how there's been, since 80% of the growth of the radius is distally, there's a rather dramatic response with improvement of the distal radial angle and centering of the carpus without um, further ado. So that's his case, uh, Dr. Jones, and he's done a nice job. And I encouraged him to put the eight plate in. He was a little skeptical and then he was happy. I apologize, I don't have cubitus varus to show, but I know it's a, a way more frequent indication in the upper extremity. My comment on cubitus varus is it's another Harold Frost regional acceleratory overgrowth of the capitellum, lateral condyle, sometimes proximal radius. And you know it's, it's rather broad when you compare it to the other elbow. So it is overgrowth and it is logical to tether the capitellum with a, an eight plate rather than resort to osteotomy in these younger kids. If you're gonna do that, since the distal humerus is only 20% of the growth and is slow, you should do that at age you know, five, six, seven, not 10, 11, 12. They'll do it early. And again, you tell the parents, this, might, this will buy time. And uh, if we're both happy, they won't need an osteotomy. And if not, when they're close to maturity, they can have an osteotomy and it won't reoccur. So I do support that idea. I just don't have a case to show. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if we have any question, please unmute yourself and ask question. Uh, just I have a again a technical question like uh, which size of the screw you use it in the distal radius? It's a standard uh, 4.5 mm screws which we use for other sites or like you use 3.5 or something like that. Yeah, this is these are either 3.5 or they might be 2.7. All you have to do is make sure the screw head doesn't go through the hole in the plate. <laughs> so in an early cubitus varus, before the eight plate, I took a semi-tubular plate, which is not flexible, flattened it in a vise so it could reverse bend and used it successfully for a while. But then when you flatten the semi-tubular plate, it changes the shape of the screw hole and the screw popped through. So here, it's very low profile. I'm guessing those are maybe 2.7 screws at the most 3.5. So whatever it doesn't, and also it doesn't matter if you mix titanium and stainless steel anymore. It's not in there long term. So use whatever hardware you need to hold the plate where you want it. Okay. Uh, then there is another question from audience uh, that not related to the today's topic, but the previous sessions uh, discussion. In a case of uh, arthrodiposis, when there is a fixed flexion deformity at the knee joint, at what age do you consider guided growth uh, for correction of the flexion deformity? Um, so those kids are very slender. Um, again, you could use lower profile hardware to accommodate that because the screw heads aren't prominent. But you know, I, I, often they're at least five or six before that's comes to our attention and, and that's not too young to do it. And you can either upon correction, take out the entire, both plates, either side of the femur or take out the metaphyseal screws if the epiphyseal screws are still in good position. I, I only recall one arthrogryposis patient where I um, took the plates out and had to put them back in about three or four years later. So it seems like, and they won't overcorrect. Clinically, you just wait till they're walking well with their knees extended with or without their braces and take out the hardware. But these five or six wouldn't be too young. And, and, and for the ankle, I've done, you know, four-year-olds and there's the complaint, well, the hardware is so prominent and they're wearing AFOs. Well, you know, use the least prominent hardware you can and make sure the AFOs aren't rubbing and, and they become less prominent over time. So um, you, you can answer those parental and physiotherapy concerns by reassurance that you expect, in the case of the knee, some crepitance or the ankle, some prominence, but it will decrease with time. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for sharing your views and we are really thankful to you. And on behalf of all the fellows, uh, like in the various centers of uh, 
India, I thank you for spending your time, sharing your vast experience on growth modulation. And we hope that uh, in coming next or two years, you come out with a new device for correction of the torsional deformity. And yeah, it, it, be it's in the works. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of interest around the world, as you know. And uh, so that's a, that's a good thing. And uh, also, I apologize to your colleagues who are still adherents of ITO for Perthes because the residents and fellows are going to challenge them now. <laughs> so that's good. Right. So thank you very much. And uh, hope you. to see you with newer ideas in coming months or coming years. Thank you okay. once again. Yeah. All right. Have a good thank day. You. Yeah. Good day. Thank you. Bye.